Hello, yeah, I'm very glad to be here. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our experience with developing so software for cluster computing and uh, big data at Berkeley. In particular, I'm going to talk a little bit about Berkeley Data Analytics Stack. And um, I, I, in this talk, I'm really going to try to give a view from the system developer. So, uh, because I think it's important to understand because people like me are the users of the test that you, uh, we discussed earlier today. And um, I think this talk will provide a compl complementary perspective to the audience um, and it will put some of the discussion about the test bed in, in, in context. Um, so over past few years as, at Berkeley, we have developed a few systems which ended up being quite uh, uh, influential, at least in industry. Um, and I'm just trying in this talk to reflect uh, on what made this project successful. And I am not going to claim that this is something we started with. We have a recipe and we started with that. Actually, this is more retrospective and is what we ended up with. So there are four elements which I, I do believe helped some of these projects to be successful. The first is that we really look at real problems. You know, experience by user. We didn't look, you know, it's not necessarily, you know, uh, problems you hear from papers or things like that. We really look at real problems, and I'm going to give, give some examples uh, during the talk. Um, the second one, among all these problems you see uh, around, we really focus with which kind of with novel user scenarios. So for we, there are no uh, obvious systems to address these user scenarios. Again, I'm going to go, uh, so instead of taking the systems, existing systems, or doing something like existing system, but better. Um, and the third will build real systems, like many of you here do. Um, and in doing that, we are really paranoid about simplicity. Why? Well, in an academic environment, it's very hard to build complex systems. It's, 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 uh, it's very hard. Um, so, you know, if you build a simple system, you are more likely to succeed. And finally, we push for adoption. This means, uh, you know, creating, developing communities and train users. And then, by having users, real users, this helped us to understand the new problems these users faced. So you go back. So this is actually our, you know, uh, basically our feedback loop, which actually worked in uh, several cases during the history of recent history of developing systems at Berkeley. As a disclaimer, I mean, by no way, I mean this is the only way to do research. It's, it's a lot of great research done in other ways. This is just capturing uh, what are the key ingredients of what I believe personally is that made some of the systems we built at Berkeley successful. So as a short history, at least, you know, I started, me and others, to do system research in, cloud, in cluster computing um, around 2006. And the first steps were, you know, looking around at the, you know, map reduce particular schedulers, improving it. One of the first artifacts was a fire scheduler, which became very popular in uh, Hadoop uh, before Yarn. And then in 2009, we started to become more, we, we, are, we are more ambitious, and we said, okay, we are going to build an entire big data stack. And we, in 2009, there were, uh, we, we started building Mesos. So Mesos actually was, you know, it's uh, always you, you hear Dave Patterson saying, you know, great tradition of Berkeley. So this was started into in uh, uh, as, as a class project, um, and then later Spark the same year, and then you know over the few uh, next few years we had you know many other systems, Shark, Spark Streaming, Tachyon, MLlib, Graphics is this year, and so forth. And these are done in this context of the Rad Lab, which was before between 2005 and 2010, and then AMLAB, 2011, and we are still, you know, it will be up until 2017. Um, 
And just to give you a sense about what these labs, uh, these labs, how they are organized and how they are run, let me say a few things about the AM lab. So the AM lab was started in January 2011. It's eight faculty, over 60 st students. The faculty span databases, systems, um, networking, machine learning, and, and so forth. Um, and we also have, uh, you know, started with two years ago, we created a three uh, people software engineering team to help us with uh, maintaining code testing and things like that and developing. Um, this is, uh, we run AMB Lab in a very open, it's like a, almost like a startup. Uh, so this is a floor plan. It's, it's also was created this floor plan and this space actually is for Rad Lab. We, AMB Lab just inherited it. And just to give you a sense, that's fact, uh, you know, for those of you who didn't visit um, the AMB Lab, that's uh, faculty sitting and it's, it's open. We don't have offices. So it's, we sit together with the students. And you know, we have a lot of, we, we, we do have a lot of interaction with the industry. Uh, we have three day retreats. Uh, the last retreat, I believe, you know, 120 people, uh, 60 people from industry, 70 people from industry. And we also started running um, <coughs> this kind of AM camps to train, to teach people from industry and academia how to use our system. The last one is AM camp should be five there, November 2014, over 220 people from more than 100 companies. And I believe that uh, the AMB Lab is an example about this, uh, what uh, uh, Jim was saying about this kind of three components. Three, uh, you know, it's like, um, it's like government funding, uh, it's NSF and DARPA and university and industry. We are at industry, we are funded by more than 20 companies, and Amazon, Google, and SAP are founding sponsors. And the goal, like I mentioned to you, of this lab was to build um, this Berkeley Data Analytics stack. Next, I'm just going for those of you who do not know much about this stack, uh, I, I think that everyone knows what you know Hadoop and Hadoop ecosystem. So I'm going to contrast a little bit of, with that. So if you look at a data processing stack, you have roughly speaking three layers, right? We like layers. We are many of us here are networking people uh, at the core. So you have a storage layer, a resource management layer, and data processing layer. And if you want to try to map Hadoop uh, ecosystem on this on this uh, uh, stack, you have at the bottom you have HDFS. And maybe you have other storage layer like S3. Uh, then you have Hadoop Yarn as a resource management layer. And data processing layer, you have a bunch of uh, systems, frameworks, we call them. Uh, like Hadoop MapReduce, on top of it, you have Hive and Peak to provide SQL processing or SQL interface to the user. Then you have other kind of systems for different kind of workloads, Storm for streaming, uh, Impala for interactive query processing, and things like that. So if we map the Berkeley Data Analytics stack on these, uh, uh, three, in, on these three layers, at the bottom, we do not have our own storage persistent and durable storage layer. We are using the existing storage layer. However, we do have a, uh, uh, in, in memory storage layer, which uh, you know, Dennis was mentioning earlier, is uh, Stachyon. At the resource management layer, we have Mesos. And a data processing layer is, again, we have our own bunch of frameworks. The only difference here is that we have only one execution engine across all these other components to, to support different workloads. That's Spark. OK, so next I'm going to talk about this a little bit about these three systems. The three is Tachyon, uh, no, is, it will be Mesos, Spark, and Tachyon. And I'm going to try to see, to show how it maps uh, to this philosophy I was mentioning at the beginning of the talk. Um, by the way, before uh, you know, there are any questions, and before going into more details, just want to say that you know we play nice with the, the Hadoop ecosystem. We are very consistent. So, for instance, Spark can run on top of Hadoop Yarn, and um, and so you are going to you can run side by side, uh, you know, the entire Hadoop stack and. and uh, Berkeley Data Analytics stack. Okay. So you can run it using Geezer, Yarn, or Mesos. 
So Mesos. So Mesos, like I mentioned, was the first system we built, uh, and the problem was simple. You know, at that time, at least in the cluster computing, uh, in in a, you know data community, in Hadoop community, you have to have for each framework, each even for each framework instance, you have to have its own cluster. And um, we saw that firsthand, you know, we, it was an issue, like, we, we started interacting with Facebook very early on. I remember the first time we visited Facebook, they were in downtown Palo Alto, and their big data cluster was 80 nodes. And their big data team, three people, two newly hired from Yahoo, who were just starting to create Hive. So we are very early. And, and there, you know, you have different workloads and you have the obvious things, right? You know, if you can share the cluster among different frameworks, you are going to be more efficient. But there are other reasons for that, which are most obvious, you know, for us like academics. Things like upgrading, right? You have Hadoop version X and you want to upgrade to version Y. Well, you have one cluster, you know, it's just hard to decide to upgrade to the new version, right? And you don't have a second cluster, you know, to, or it's very expensive. Um, and then also want to experiment, experiment, right? Even, you know, whether to, to upgrade or not, right? <laughs> um, and uh, the other thing is that you can, yes, you can, even if you have different clusters, here you are talking about big data. It's not only computation. So now if you have big, you are, you are going to build for the data. If you have it in one cluster and you have to access from a different cluster, it can be slow, right? Mm -hmm. So all of this, uh, all of this, for all of these reasons, uh, we we started Mesos, and Mesos is a common resource sharing layer which provides abstraction and virtualize the resources to frameworks. So in one word, you know, if you want to um, want things to think about, you know, if you want to remember from this slide one thing, like Jim was saying, you know, it just is like multi-programming for data centers. Okay, so that's what it is. Um, so Apache Mesos, we open source in 2010, and the first release heavy, has, you know, had only 10,000 lines of code. That's all. Um, it became an Apache project in 2012, and starting two, uh, two and a half years ago, uh, it was used in production at Twitter. And now it's over 10,000 machines, over 500 engineering using it. And now, this does, didn't come for free. Actually, it's uh, uh, Ben Hinman, who was my student, he spent a lot of time at Twitter. Actually, he, he still has to come back to finish his PhD. <laughs> so, you know, it's, you know, it's not like, it, it's very easy, you know, to get these companies using your stuff, as you know. Um, and then I said that, okay, so I told you, you know, it's a real problem. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty, you know, the first version is pretty simple. Um, and then about building communities, that was one of the other uh, things I said that uh, it was really important for the success of this component. So in September 2012, we started these meetups, right? So meetups, you know, organize the different companies in the Bay Area. People come, start to play with Mesos, you know, ask questions. It's kind of building a community, right? People are meeting face to face. Now it has over 800 members. And there are other user groups, you know, in, in other cities, I think seven cities in, uh, and also other countries, France, Netherlands, and UK, and oh, another 700 members uh, outside Bay Area. And this is growing pretty fast. Also, the contributors to the code, one, it was, uh, it was open, and when, especially when it becomes Apache, you know, increased, uh, you know, this is number of contributors, unique contributors per month, and over the, past 12 months, there are 65 contributors. And now it's very rapidly increasing. It's, it's a company, Mesosphere, behind Mesos. And it's, um, you know, this is, it, it's, now it's skyrocketing everything. Um, and if you look, <coughs> selected users, you know, many companies, not only Twitter, eBay is using it, Netflix is using it, also Google, Google is playing with it, DigitalOcean is using it, and many other companies. So that's one. This was Mesos. Apache Spark is arguably our most successful project to date. And what was the problem we tried to solve? Well, 
there are two things, you know, at that point, you have MapReduce, which great framework, allow for the first time to do batch processing at huge scale using community servers. But we, we started to see the need, like others, uh, I, was, I should say, for different, to support different workloads. And in particular for Azure or two, which are obvious then, one was iterative computation. So in Rad Lab, we have also, like a machine learning people, and the machine learning people want to start, you know, to, to run machine learning algorithms at scale. Okay, so what, they come to us, they say, okay, I want to do that. Well, why don't we use MapReduce, right? How do MapReduce is there, right? Um, the problem is, as you know, you know, this MapReduce is very slow because each, each iteration is a hard do, it's a MapReduce job, and between iteration, you need to write the data on the disk and read it from the disk. It's very super slow. The other one is interactive queries, and I've seen this, you know, personally I've seen that I was, I was uh, uh, you know, on leave starting this company, Conviva, uh, and then from Facebook, that people really want to get, once they have kind of SQL, right, kind of interface, like Hive and Pig, you know, you, you know, you bring this kind of peep database people, you know, you, you know, try start to explore data. But these, these people are, are used to be fast, right, kind of interactive. This is not, right, because you need to run multiple map radio jobs per query. So we, um, so that we, we start, uh, you know, it was, it was Spark. And one interesting thing that Spark, one of the reasons it was created was also to demonstrate that Mesos, in Mesos, is much easier to develop new frameworks, right? Because Mesos has all the plumbing. Detect on the nose is going down, is doing the scheduling, isolate the resources between frameworks, all of this stuff. So you say, you know, it's very easy. Um, so we developed Apache Spark, and <laughs> it's, um, you know, like probably some of you know, uh, it uh, has a fault-tolerant, efficient in-memory abstraction. It's called resilient distributed data sets. It has low latency, large-scale um, uh, task scheduler, and it provides a powerful programming model uh, and APIs. You can write, develop programming in Python, Scala, and Java. Um, as a result, because you can also process data in memory, it's much faster than how to memory reduce. And the way you can think about it, you can run sub-second jobs in on hundreds of servers. So that's what, 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 what it can do. Um, it's also because it doesn't have only the map reduce abstraction, it has like more than 100 uh, abstraction now, and you can easily add uh, new ones. It's much easier to develop new code, so it typically takes between two and five times less lines of code to develop an application in Spark than in MapReduce. And the most important thing is general, because you can, right now, and I'm not going to talk that much about, but this is, turns out to be extremely important. So right now, if you look in the Hadoop ecosystem, for different workloads, you have to build different systems. Hadoop MapReduce is for, for batch. Storm is for streaming. Impala is interactive query. So you need to build this, all these systems, and it's difficult to manage them, to steer them together, all of these things. Because Apache Spark as an execution engine can do things very fast, and in parallel, we could use it as a substrate for supporting all these different workloads, right? Um, <coughs> And what you see is these blocks, you know, this on top of Spark, like Spark streaming, uh, Spark SQL, and graphics, and so forth, and MLlib, these are basically libraries. The execution engine is Spark, okay? Um, the open source, this is the beauty of it, because again, objective, one of the objectives was to show that it's very easy to write new frameworks on top of Mesos. It was less than 3,000 lines of code. That was the first uh, um, uh, release. And become about 2013, it was become it became an uh, Apache project. And this is going back the next bullet. Go back to what I t told you that it was you know it, it, execution engines were very general and it's fast. So you could bu build all these components easily on top of it. So this is what we've done in the subsequent years to support to better support different workloads. Um, and, you know, today you, we see more and more applications being built on uh, Spark, and many of the companies are, who are, whose, who, whose application are running on Hadoop MapReduce are moving on Spark. So in terms of building a community, it was, you know, very successful. So we started in 2012, it's again, uh, meetups. 
Now in the Bay Area alone, there are more than 31 hundreds. And I just got this, uh, you know, two hours ago. So today we have more than 40 groups, more than almost 1,100 members, and 33 cities and 13 countries. And if you look at the monthly contribution, you know, it's, um, you know, it's, it's growing very fast. In the last 12 months, it's 371 contributors. So <laughs> now let me give you another, another plot. So let me just give you. Even if you look in terms of number of commits, lines of code changes, you may ask how you compare these numbers with other projects. And at least right now, at least for the past six months, in both this dimension, any dimension you consider, it's, it's more active, Spark is more active than many well-known big data projects, and even than other well-known projects, like Mongo open source data projects, or computation projects, MongoDB, NumPy, D3, or Julia. So by only all these dimensions, you know, you can say, you know, it's, uh, it was a success, and of course in industry also it enjoys now wide support, every Hadoop distributor also including its distribution, Spark, and one thing we are being very happy is that <coughs> it's beyond, it's go beyond just a Hadoop ecosystem because it's just a computation engine. So one is one is a computation engine, so you can get data from uh, from other storage sources, like uh, Dennis was showing, right? From a, uh, AWS, uh, DataStack, it's a company behind Cassandra, say Key Value Store, SAP, you know, they have this HANA in memory database and so forth. And today it's used by hundreds of companies. Also part of the community building, and now we have support also from uh, commercial entities. Uh, we run Spark Summit now, the 1st of December 2013, and it's just less than one year, or almost one year back. Um, we had 450 attendees, then we ran another one in June, we have 1,100 attendees, and now next year we are going to have two Spark Summits, one East and one West. So finally, let me say a few words about Acheon, which is one of our most recent projects. And the problem here is that this is one example in which we have people using Spark and we solve the problem. We are the first, some of the first to see the problem, which is an advantage, always an advantage. So Spark gets one of the reasons it's so fast is can, you can cache data. But then you want to have multiple Spark instances. You don't want to share the jobs in production, for instance, from people who do experiments using Spark. And then you need to cache data in each Spark instance because the Spark uh, cluster is a bunch of JVMs. So we wanted, that was one reason, and there are other reasons, right? You want to decouple the computation from storage because if, the, if you have them couple and the JVM crashes, then you now you have 60 gigabytes of RAM, then it takes forever to just close the data back. So the solution was to provide this, to build this tachyon, which was in memory storage system. It provides a flexible API and supports also HDFS API and allow multiple uh, frameworks to share the data which is uh, in, in, in memory data or SSD data. So Tachyon is again, it just, uh, it's, it's a storage layer. Um, it doesn't provide durability or persistence. It assumes that there is an underlying file system doing that. But because of that, it's much easier to modify it, right? Because you don't need to be worried that you are going to lose data. The data, it will be stored in the underlying file system. Um, it's open source in December 2012. It's uh, less than 10,000 lines of code. Now it's much bigger, for better or worse. And it's becoming the narrow waste. Uh, it's starting for storage in, in big data space. It's also, you know, this is release grow. We, uh, you know, based on uh, number of uh, users, um, this is uh, for each release. So more than, now there are more than 60 contributors. And it's a, I didn't show this in the other cases because but that's even more skewed. But most of the contribution, even for Tachyon, Tachyon is not even right now an Apache project or an Apache incubator that will happen probably over the next few months. The most contributors come, come from outside Berkeley. And it's again, it's used by quite a few companies. And you know, this is another way to show what Dennis showed you, so that nice 
figure where tachyon was in the middle and you have underlying file systems and frameworks on top, these are of some file systems which are support, underlying file systems which are support, supported by tachyon. And you know, this is just to say that actually there is some commitment from the industry behind Dacion. So while at this point is not as successful as Mesos or Spark, you know, it's uh, we are pretty optimistic about its uh, its future, like this. Uh, so one other things I want to, to to make sure is that the education and the training is super super important. So one side, one point, you know, on, on one side you want to create these communities, and on the other side, you, again, you want to train new people. So, um, like I mentioned, in August 2012, we have the first AM camp. We have 100 people. It was we ran into for one day and a half at Berkeley. We have 150 people showing in person, and we have 3,000 people online, and it's now a regular event. We run it, the last one we run it, like I mentioned to you in November, we also run it as Strata, Tutorial, in New York we have over 450 people, 80% new to Spark, uh, and this year alone, you know, through all of these uh, events, we, we train like 1,800 people, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a big scale. And now, because we are academics, right, I just want to make sure that we also have not only industrial impact, you know, we have, you know, we have papers, we have best paper awards, we also have what we are the most proud of, great students. Just the last two years ago, we have three people uh, becoming faculty at MIT and one at Stanford, Microsoft Research and many other schools. And um, the other thing we are very excited about actually, because you are kind of the first to look at new problems. We start to have impact in other fields rather than the system, other areas. Like for instance, one case is resource allocation uh, with the uh, domino resource fairness, and that turns out to also have impact in microeconomy, which is, you know, where the resource allocation happens. So that was very satisfying. Um, for machine learning, when we started to do, you know, to use bootstrap to estimate the error, it turns out that you really need to diagnose, so to see whether the bootstrap is working or not, whether the assumption under the, which the bootstrap is working um, are met uh, by the particular query and the data. So this is bootstrap diagnosis, which I think it's again, it's a pretty exciting new direction um, in machine learning. And the biggest example is, you know, it's, uh, you know, is uh, you know, Dave Patterson has this project, which is uh, is, is leading this project on cancer genomics, and which is built on top of our stack. And uh, there is a fast, uh, you know, I am not going to go to all the jargon. To make the story short, it's make the entire sequencing a pipeline much, much faster, between 10 and 50 times uh, faster. And, you know, there is this paper in New England Journal of Medicine in which shows how at uh, UCSF, because of the speed of the diagnosis enabled by the system, you know, one, uh, you know, the life of one young fellow uh, could have been saved, was saved. So. Okay, so I'm just going to conclude. Uh, I have a few slides of conclusion. So just to, to, to close the, the circle, like I mentioned, the, when, we, when I look back and I try to extract away what are the ingredients of the success, I think that one of them was to follow and look at real problems. The second one is to focus on novel use scenario. The third one is to build real systems. And here you want to build very simple systems to start to start, uh, to start with and push for adoption. And it's again, these are interrelated, right? Because for instance, just to make a point here, um, because you, you, if you are focusing on new user scenarios, you end up and you can get away with building simple systems. The first operating system has a few thousand, thousand lines of code. Now, if you build an operating system, you know, it's, it has to have several hundreds of thousand lines of code, you know, just to be on the map, right? Um, it's, you know, so, and, and the fact that you have users using your system is very important because this allows you to be the one of the first to understand the problems, right? 
Um, look, we, we work with the industry very well and so forth, but you have to realize that if you look, if you go to Facebook or some uh, Microsoft, people will tell you what they believe are the problems. It's one level of filtering. Everyone, I am, if you ask me what are the problems, I'm adding, adding my own filter, right? It's different from you seeing the problem in the first place, right? You are removed one hop. So that's very, very important. So another way to look at it and look at the projects we've done so far, I can classify them in two classes. One, this is new systems. It's, this is what I was talking so far. Inspired from people using uh, ours or existing systems. You have very, you know, visibility. You are there, you see it, you understand the problem, you come with a solution to solve the problem. Because this is what it is, right? We are here, what we, we are very good at problem solving, right? So, you know, working on the right problem, seeing the problem is the most, it's one of the most important things okay, we can do. The second class of the project, new algorithms, techniques, optimizations. And here we had a lot of, uh, we got a lot of uh, benefits from being some of the few have access to traces from the big clusters, in particular Hadoop, uh, sorry, in particular we had uh, access to some trace, traces from Facebook. And this, it's a, it's, it's a, you know, it's a line of uh, work in which resulted a lot of papers and algorithms which are used in the systems later. Late Sparrow, Pac-Man, Scarlet, and so forth. And I should also add here the DRF. DRF is a little bit in between, but you know, uh, the dominant resource fairness. So now, let me just, I am, uh, I am done, to one or two more minutes. Um, so now, I want to come back with the discussion and what we discussed here about this experimental clouds and so forth. So when I look at this, we need to, and I, I haven't heard that much, basically, there is a, the elephant in the room is public clouds. Look, in, when we started Rad Lab in 2005, our goal, and we wanted to build a big cluster. Two years in, the, in, in this uh, project, we basically, it was, you know, of, of course, it helps the fact that Amazon was one of our, uh, our sponsors. We switched and we started to use uh, AWS, okay? And we need to understand, you know, so why is that? Because it's hugely convenient and powerful. It's powerful. And you can get a lot of nodes. For instance, um, October, September, October, we, you know, we uh, competed for this terabyte sort benchmark. And we ran Spark on Amazon, 206 nodes. And we tied for the first place, and um, it's three times faster and uses 10 times fewer machines than a last year record, which is the ASCUS record on an internal cluster. Okay? So it's non trivial. Um, the other thing is that we are talking about users, right? You want users because you understand what problems they are facing. Well, guess what? If your system runs in AWS, Azure, or Google Compute, or any other you know, cloud provider, you have users. It's much easier for people to get it and use it. And people beyond academia, right? Which is good. And it's much easier to train people, right? We train people on, uh, you know, based on inst Amazon instances. And finally, in these public clouds, you have large public data sets. You know, just go there for the data sets. If you haven't, you, you didn't go there. And you see there are some impressive data sets available in Amazon. Okay? Now, why we want to use still experimental test beds? And I think there are some of you which are cited several times today. One is control and visibility. You have more control. This is undeniable. You have bare metal servers, although here, bare metal servers are also provided by some cloud providers like Rackspace, DigitalOcean. However, we have SDN networks, maybe you have access to RDMAs and so forth. This is more than what you get in the, in the cloud, in the public cloud. And then you have this ability to reconfigure everything. You have very heterogeneous machines. All of these public uh, providers, they try to be homogeneous because it's easier to manage. So that's an advantage. And, of course, it's free once you, once you get the grant, right? Uh, so this enables end-to-end cross-layer optimization. This is what it enables. You can focus on that. You cannot do that in the public cloud. Now, two more slides. What about data and applications? This is very important. 
you know, because idealists were talking about big data, right? This is, this is what we are talking about. So you, you want to provide some unique data, data sets which is not found in other clouds. And actually you have one. It's fine-grained log traces of cloud usages. Amazon and the other cannot give you this. They cannot, right? Because privacy and so forth. Maybe there are some scientific data, I don't know. But it has, it's worse to think about what kind of data you can provide which is not available in the public cloud. And then applications. Then he's made a very good point. You know, let's put, let's put this to, a stack because you want users, right? Well, if you put this stack, you need to have resources to maintain it because you are going to modify it, to run it better on that thing. You need to apply the patches, all of this stuff. So that's a that's non-trivial amount of work. And maybe there are new education applications. We are the educators. So in conclusion, I think, you know, it's... <laughs> I always like to say, you know, the secret of success is to have the right expectation. Like the success is the difference between reality and expectation. So there are two ways to have success. Lower the expectations, right? Or, you know, that's one of them. So I think we should be aware that public clouds cover a big range of needs for system research. No question about that. And the second one, let's recognize that the insights for new use cases, they are unlikely to come, I'm not saying won't come, they are unlikely to come from these testbeds. Why? Because you have a lot of more people outside which do not use the testbed. We are not like ARPANET, where there is only ARPANET. If you want to do networking, you have to use that. So all the users are there. That's different. So then what remains? is focus on what is unique, right? Cross-layer optimization, exploiting access to the network, storage, bare-bone servers, this is something which is unique. And the other thing, like I mentioned in the previous slide, think about, let's think about what kind of data, unique data, we can provide here, which is not available public clouds, okay? And if you achieve those, I think it will be a very, very successful effort. Thank you. And sorry for